Today's Bible reading is Luke chapter 22, verse 14 to 23. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and dive it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to invite James to come up. He's going to deliver the message. Um, good to hear from you. Uh, maybe I'll ask you a couple of questions. Firstly, um, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, this is my wife, Zenny, over here. Um, who I'm very thankful to be married to. We've got two little kids, Benjamin, who's in here, and Anna, who's probably screaming in creche. Um, So that's a lot of fun and a lot of work. Um, But I'm studying at Christ College at the moment, just down the road, Um, in my third year at the moment and final year next year. And um, I guess for us both, we're just currently discerning where the Lord's calling us, whether to stay here in Sydney or to um, go on the mission field in Thailand. So we're sort of wrestling with that at the moment. Yeah. We are very thankful that we have James with us. Maybe I'll ask you one more question. How do you get into Bible college? Yeah, um, there's a secret test and secret code language. And, no. <laughs> um, so simply, um, some people go to Bible college to be better equipped with their knowledge of the scriptures. And so um, there's nothing special that you need to do. I think that college wants to make sure that you're someone who um, is serious about your faith, that you are walking in step with the spirit um, and are genuinely a Christian. I think that's pretty important. Um, But for those who are pursuing pastoral ministry, it's something that the local church um, gets behind you and backs you with. Uh, And so it's, for me, it's very much been um, the affirmation of the elders and pastors in our local church and also the inner conviction driving. So it's both of those two things working hand in hand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll hand it over to you, James. Great. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much for having me in your church family. Uh, It's a great privilege to bring the Word of God to you, and I always love meeting brothers and sisters um, across Sydney because we have everything in common, even though we don't know each other um, the best yet. Um, If you would keep your Bibles open, we'll be looking through that text um, today, looking through each verse in particular. Um, But before we begin, why don't I open our time in prayer? Uh, So please join with me as I bring our request before our Father in heaven. Father, we pray this morning that you would speak to us through your powerful word. Father, we thank you that you have spoken through your son. Father, reveal Christ to us today as we read your word. I pray that you would soften our hearts and soften our spirits, that we would receive Christ with thanksgiving and would behold wondrous things in your law. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, no matter where you come from and no matter what language you speak, no matter what culture you were brought up in, I suspect that you all love celebrations. We all love celebrations because they are what makes life fun. Uh, We always look forward to celebrations. 
For some of you, maybe it's the weekend. You know, every, um, every week you're just looking forward to that Saturday and Sunday break. I remember when I worked in the office, it seemed that from Monday to Friday, all that people could talk about was their previous weekend, and then by Friday afternoon, everyone's just excited for this next weekend. Maybe if it's not weekends, it's birthdays. I know that my sister-in-law, Zen sister, um, loves birthdays, seems to remember everyone's birthday, everyone's anniversary. I don't know how she does it, but I'm thankful that God has blessed certain people with that gift. But she looks forward to birthdays and celebrations. And you see, we mark out these celebrations in our calendars because celebrating is part of being human. And in essence, we celebrate because we believe that some things are worth celebrating. And yet, however fun and exciting these celebrations are, they never seem to deliver what they promise. For instance, while we look forward to the weekend, Saturday morning comes and maybe you got out of bed a little bit later than you thought and maybe the kids are being difficult. I wonder, you know, who I'm speaking about here, you know, we, we get to about 11 a.m. and it's like we haven't even got out of the house yet. And so your plans to enjoy a Saturday outing are really just turned into a protracted morning routine expecting that next weekend things will be different. Or you might look forward to the summer break only to have your Christmas lunch interrupted by a fight between relatives or even just a sober reminder that there's an empty chair at the Christmas table that wasn't empty last year because it was once filled with a loved one. And so while we love celebrations, we also know that these celebrations will never leave us fulfilled. These expectations are never met and we're always left unsatisfied, believing that things will be different next time. Which raises the question for all of us, is there a celebration that actually lasts, a celebration that truly satisfies the inner recesses of our souls? A celebration that doesn't wear off. Well, friends, today we come to a text in the Bible where I believe God offers us such a celebration. He offers us a celebration, an eternal one that never ceases and one which never fades. And today I want to draw attention to a meal Jesus provides as the ultimate cause for celebration. And uh, to help you walk through this text with me, I've broken the text into three different sections which you'll see on your outline in front of you. The first section being uh, the setting of the scene of the celebration in verse 14. Second of all, the new celebration from verses 15 to 18. And finally, a substitution worth celebrating. So we start with verse 14. Uh, Luke here sets the scene for what is happening in this narrative. If you look with me to verse 14, we read, and when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. Let's just stop here for a moment. Um, First, what is the hour that Jesus is referring to here? What's the specific hour? Well, leading up to this passage in Luke chapter 22, there's this progressive zooming in on this event so that we would see the significance of what is taking place here. If you just look, if you've got a physical Bible, look up to verse 1 of chapter 22. You notice that the feast of unleavened bread drew near. Then verse 7, then came the day of unlimited bread. And then now in verse 14, the hour came. And so there's this progressive zooming in so that we would see the monumental significance of this feast. And so he's mentioning specifically that it's not just any hour, but the hour of Passover. And whether you are familiar with the Old Testament or not, maybe it's helpful to do a bit of a recap of what Passover was. It was the annual celebration of the Jews that God had instituted to commemorate his deliverance of his people out of Egypt. He declared in the first nine judgments, judgments against Egypt, and then on the final judgment that he would destroy the firstborn sons of Egypt. And yet, whilst promising judgment... He also promised deliverance to the Israelites who would slay a lamb and paint the doors of their houses with the blood of a lamb. And so essentially this lamb acted as a substitute so that their son wouldn't be killed. And so while Passover, biblically speaking, was a day of judgment, it was also a day of salvation. And this is necessary as we consider the second thing we notice in this text. So we second of all, let us notice the uniqueness of this 
Passover. We find this emphasized again in verse 15. If you look with me to verse 15, Jesus refers to this Passover as not just Passover, but this Passover. He wants us to see that this Passover is different. There's something that's going to change this time around, and we'll see that in just a moment. But third of all, let us see that Jesus is the focus and the attention of this meal. You'll notice in verse 14 that Jesus, that we read Luke say, Jesus reclined at table and his apostles with him. You see, it's not the food that's the focus, or even the feast that's the focus, or the ritual. The focus of this meal centers upon the person of Jesus Christ. Luke wants us to see that Jesus is the focus of the meal. He's the host of the celebration, and he's the main character in the narrative. And I think this is important because this meal is not an end in itself. So often we think about the Lord's Supper in all different sorts of ways, but this meal is about Jesus, and he's about to change and transform Passover forever. Which brings us to our next point, the new celebration that Jesus institutes, and we find this in verse 15. In verse 15, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. It's easy to skip over words in the Bible when we read these passages because we've read them so many times. But there's this really powerful phrase I want to draw our attention to that we read here. Jesus says, I earnestly desired. It's an emphatic phrase to try and highlight some of the emotions and the inner turmoil and the tension that's going on in Jesus' heart. And you might be asking, in what sense did Jesus eagerly desire to eat Passover? I mean, was he just hangry? Was he just really keen to eat a meal because he was uh, starving at this moment? Well, I don't think this is the case because if we zoom back for a moment and consider the context of this passage, we realize that the atmosphere is not necessarily a joyful celebration at this point. The ambience is intense. And this passage speaks something of the tension between light and darkness, and we see that with Judas' betrayal. And so, though Jesus desires to eat of this meal, he is aware of the suffering that is about to follow. And so, this phrase may also be translated an all consuming passion. It's not a gentle desire, but an aggressive, unquenchable craving to do something. And so, Jesus says in verse 15, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And so it is directly connected with the suffering that is to follow. And so it's not merely to eat the food, but rather to eat this Passover before he suffers. I want to draw our attention to something else in this text, or rather something that's not written. I suspect some of the most important things in the Bible are not necessarily what is written, but what is not written, what is missing in the text. I think there is something missing from this meal, something that was essential to Passover, that made Passover, Passover. I wonder whether you can see what's missing in the text before us. You see, unlike the Passover of Exodus chapter 12, you won't find in this text a lamb's blood spread on the doorpost. In fact, no matter how hard you look all throughout this text, you won't find even one mention of a lamb. And why is this the case? Because I suspect God wants us to find something far greater, something far more precious than an unblemished lamb. For rather than a spotless lamb, we find a perfect and a righteous and a holy man, one who never sinned and whom Luke has led us to this point in the gospel, showing us that he is the perfect righteousness of God. And so while we don't see a lamb sacrificed in the text, we encounter an even greater lamb. We encounter Jesus Christ the Lamb of God, to whom all of the old lambs in the Old Testament were merely shadows of the glory of this man. You see, they were all looking forward to a true lamb, one who would actually bear upon himself the sins of the world. And yet, this text doesn't just describe who this lamb is in the person of Jesus, but what he did to save us. And so we come to our final point now, a substitution worth celebrating in verse 19. 
Before we look into this text, I suspect that it's helpful to think through what exactly a substitute is. It's easy to use this terminology as Christians um, all the time without stopping to just think about what exactly we're talking about. Um, At the simplest level, a substitute is something that takes another's place. And so, I mean, if you're cooking a recipe, uh, cooking a dish using a recipe book and you come across an ingredient that you've missed and you forgot to pick it up at the supermarket, you might grab an alternate ingredient and substitute it in its place. Or on a more serious level, if you're convicted of a crime and have to pay the fine, you have two options. You either pay it yourself or someone pays it for you. And if someone pays this fine, they are acting as a substitute. They are taking upon themselves the penalty of your crime and absorbing the cost. And so when we think about substitution here today, it's not just like the recipe sort of substitution. This is the penalty sort of substitution. The act of taking another's place so that they are no longer subject to the penalty of the law. And as Christians, we believe that there is no salvation without a substitute. For either we take the judgment of God or we accept a substitute that he has provided. And so here we find the fulfillment of Passover, that which Passover was constantly pointing us towards and showing us. Here we find Christ presented as the true lamb, the true substitute. And we find him the substitute in verse 19. If you look with me to verse 19, Jesus says, And he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. First, let us notice the substitutionary language of Jesus. He doesn't just give the disciples bread and wine to eat as a meal. He first identifies the bread with his body and the wine with his blood. You see, there's nothing magical about these elements. They don't magically transform into the body and blood of Jesus. But rather, Jesus is telling his disciples what is about to take place when he faces the cross. And if you remember, this supper occurred the very night of Jesus' betrayal. And the disciples weren't aware of what was going to happen to Jesus. They probably should have been, but they were so distracted with other things that they had missed this central point. And so in these verses, in verse 19 and verse 20, we see the pinnacle of self-sacrifice and sacrificial love that is revealed You see, Jesus is giving up his blameless and righteous life in the place of tainted sinners like you and I. And through the broken body of Jesus, as symbolized by the bread, he offers new life to those who would receive it. And in a shell, this is the gospel in edible form. It's a proclamation of the gospel every time we have the Lord's Supper. It's not a meal that happened by accident, but one that God intended to endow with significant meaning. But the second thing I want to highlight in this verse here in verse 19 is God's sovereignty over the events that are happening here. Did you notice the word given in verse 19? It's an important word because it reminds us that it is not the Romans or the Jews or even his disciples who are in control of his destiny. You see, Jesus' death wasn't plan B. Rather, Jesus' death was a voluntary act of love, a voluntary act giving up himself for the sake of his people. You see, he willingly laid down his life so that we wouldn't face the righteous judgment of God. And in simile, in verse 20, Jesus says that the cup is poured out, not accidentally, but poured out for you. You see, Jesus is fully aware that his life is coming to an end. But Jesus is not a passive character in this story. Jesus is in control of what is happening. And we probably see this in the most profound way in verse 22 when we read, For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. It's no accident. It's no mistake. It's been foreordained by God. And though evil men thought that they were destroying Jesus and thwarting the plans of God, God was working behind the scenes through his sovereign will. 
My friend, this, my friends, this is a substitution that is truly worth celebrating. And you might be wondering, how does this text apply to us today? In what ways does this transform life for us in the 21st century? If I break down the application, I'd like to address those of us here today in two uh, groups. First of all, I'd like to address those of us here today who are Christians, who would describe ourselves as such. In the text before us, there is only one command, and we find that command in verse 19. There's one command for us today. The Lord Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's not a once-off command, but a command of continually doing something, to keep doing this in remembrance of me. And why does Jesus tell us to do this in remembrance of me? It's not for the sake of mere ritual. Rather, put simply, it's because we forget the centrality of Christ's death. You know, many of you will be familiar with that great hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. In that final stanza, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Isn't that just so true of all of us? But what are the signs that we've forgotten the centrality of Christ's death for us? What are the signs that we've forgotten to remember this important event? I suspect that one of the easiest ways to detect whether we have strayed is that we forget that we are dependent creatures and we take upon ourselves burdens that only God was meant to bear. And so on one hand, a key indicator that we've forgotten the centrality of the cross is that we are living in fear because we've forgotten the forgiveness and the acceptance and the love of Christ, we search for these things in other people. And so we live in fear of man rather than the fear of God, and we are left anxious and weary and burdened. I know for me, this is such a true case so often, and this is why I need to hear these truths as much as you. But on the other hand, you might have gone to the opposite end of the spectrum where you're not anxious with those sort of things, but you've become slothful in your faith. Evangelism doesn't really excite you anymore. You've become lax about the gospel. And in fact, living for God's glory isn't really your biggest concern or the driving motivation behind what you do. You see, inevitably, if we aren't consumed with Christ... We become consumed with worldly things and with our own passions and specifically with worldly celebrations. You know, there's, something pro- there's, a, there's a problem with us when we are more excited about Christmas than we are about Christ or when we're more excited about the grand final than we are about the Lord's Supper. It's an indication that something's not right in our hearts and that something needs to be fixed. And what grace is there for people like us in this camp? How does God address our feeble, fearful, and forgetful hearts? The thing I love about Jesus, brothers and sisters, is that he doesn't harshly rebuke us. He doesn't destroy you. Rather, he draws your attention to the essence of your faith. He draws your attention to his all-sufficient death for you. He draws you to see that your worth and your value and your, uh, your acceptance is not something that's self-generated, but it's something given to you by a perfect savior. And how does Jesus draw us to see this? Well, I mean, if we think about it, he could have just told us to remember his death for us. Just remember that I died for you. Remember that I rose from the dead and hope in that. But that's not what he did. The Lord Jesus gave us a meal to remember something far greater And he does it through the bread and the wine. It's the gospel in edible form. Brothers and sisters, his body and his blood were shed for you. Not so that you would live in doubt and insecurity and in fear, but so that you would live in confidence to approach the throne of grace. A right relationship with God marked not by fear, but forgiveness. And you see, even when you wander and even when you fall, you're met with a merciful Savior. And so Jesus commands you to do this in remembrance of me because he knows that we're frail. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we're forgetful. And he knows how much we need to be frequently reminded that you are loved, you are accepted, you are secure, and you are acceptable in his sight. And so how can we partake in the Lord's Supper in a mere ritualistic way after hearing this. 
We can't partake of the Lord's Supper as if it was, were magically forgiving us of our sins. In fact, if we think that that is the case, we've probably missed Jesus' whole point here. So in what manner are we to receive the Lord's Supper? I believe it's to receive it in remembrance of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. This is not a dead remembrance like you're visiting the cemetery and reflecting upon the life of Jesus. Rather, it's an active remembering, remembering that he died and rose and that he currently reigns over all creation. And so it's not this dry and sterile ritual, but one that's living and active, one that is a powerful demonstration and proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For by doing so, you'll find true cause for celebration. But I suspect that there may be some here today who are not yet believers, who have not yet put their faith in Christ. The first thing to say is that we love having non-believers in our midst. We love to have you here because at the end of the day, we're just beggars who found the bread and we want to share that with you. There's nothing about us that's more special. We just have a very special savior. And so let me ask you the question that I asked before. What is it that you celebrate? Because we all celebrate something. We all live for something. But I suspect deep down you know that whatever you're celebrating, it's like a sugar rush. The excitement seems to fade off quicker than you would imagine. And once that excitement wears off, the celebration passes away like a mist in the wind. And I know that you know this because if the satisfaction lasted, you wouldn't keep going back to it. But let me ask an even more unsettling question. Are your celebrations just a distraction from something deeper that's wrong with you? Are they just a distraction from your fears of the morbid realities of life? That you one day will die and will stand before God? I suspect that at the deepest level, worldly celebrations at times offer a promising distraction from the morbid realities of life and specifically a distraction from the reality of your guilt before a holy God. You know, you have shame for the things that you've done, things you would never want anyone to know about, grudges and revenge in your heart, anger, hatred, addictions, sexual sin. And deep down, you know there's a God, but the idea of facing him in your unworthiness is not an option. And so you live in this guilt and shame, which ends up getting masked by celebrations as this coping mechanism to distract you from this guilt and this shame. If this is you today, you have come to the right place because you've come to the right person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus shares something with you today that is truly worth celebrating. He offers you a celebration that isn't just there to mask the terrors of life, but a festivity that marks his victory over the very thing that you are trying to mask, the guilt and the shame that you deal with. My friend, Jesus today welcomes you to receive him by faith. He welcomes you to trust that his body and blood are sufficient to cleanse you from your sin and to give you new life. And my friend, this is the gospel that God will never again hold against you the sin that is burdening your conscience. He will never again hold it against you if you place your trust in him. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And you might be the sort of person who says, that sounds like a great idea, but you don't understand how sinful I am. You don't understand what I've done. My friend, Jesus, the Jesus we encounter in the Bible is not stingy with his love. He promises that those who come to him, he will never cast away. You see, there's nothing you've done that is not forgivable by Christ. There's nothing you've done that God doesn't already know. He knows all your thoughts and your actions and what you've said. And you may have been thinking about Jesus for some time, but haven't resolved at this until this point to leave your former life behind. And my friend, if this is you, I would pray that you would see how deep and high and wide the love of Christ is for sinners like you. His precious blood is able to wash even the man who thinks is beyond forgiveness. For you see, Jesus came not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. He came not to heal the healthy, but to heal the sick. 
And so come to him today, bring with you all of your sin and your sorrows and lay it at the foot of the cross. For the only way to receive Christ is to receive him with open hands, nothing in our hands we bring. And the promise is that if you receive him by faith, you'll not only be relieved of your fear of death, you'll actually have reason to celebrate right now something infinitely greater than any worldly festivity and an eternal celebration with God and his people, a feast that's only made possible through Jesus Christ, the true Passover lamb. Friends, allow me to finish with a quote from the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, who writes, the invitation to come and dine gives us a vision of what union with Jesus is. Because the only food that we can feast upon when we dine with Jesus is himself. Oh, what a union this is. It is a depth which reason cannot fathom that we thus feed upon Jesus. And may this be true of us today as we fix our eyes upon our merciful Lord and our merciful Savior. Please join me as I pray. Father, we thank you that you are a gracious God, a God who calls sinners like us to come to your throne of grace to receive mercy in our time of need. Lord, we thank you for giving us the Lord's Supper as an active proclamation of Christ's all-sufficient work. Father, we confess that so often we forget the centrality of the cross, and so we search for meaning, for acceptance, for forgiveness, for purpose in other things. And yet, Father, this morning we ask that you would help us to have our eyes fixed upon the all-sufficient, all-powerful, and all-forgiving work of Christ our Lord. And we pray, Lord, that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we would do it indeed in remembrance of him who died to set us free. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.